about, but it's, just, it's because we do believe in being hospitable. If you're here, today's your first time, can you just stand for a moment? We would love just to say hello to you. Wow, that's... So, Founder Life folks, come on, don't, that's right, thing. don't just stare them down, they're not going to come back anymore. Ask them how they're doing, ask them their name. Thank you all so much for doing that. I've been talking about the three E's, but look, this, this EQ concept, we're talking about um, engaging our community, engulfing our community, and also empowering our community. And today is the the three, uh, the last of the three E's that I'm talking about, well, the three major E's, I'm gonna be talking about the infrastructure part, um, probably one more week, but really talking about um, what it means to really to be present in the Lord's, in, in, on the Lord's behalf inside a community. So, so many, so many wonderful things are taking place. And I want us to understand how to be about the Lord's business. Everyone is about their business because that's how you know you're doing well. And I think it's important for us as God's people to be able to, Nick and Steph, how are you guys doing? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, saw some old, I just saw some old friends. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to embarrass you guys. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I married this couple back when they were, can you guys just stand for a minute? Nick, I like the hair, dude. It is good seeing you guys. <laughs> All right, I'm going to message you guys a little bit later. But they're part of a cool church plant. It's good to see you guys. <laughs> they threw me all off and everything. We want to be able to be effective in looking at what God has called us to do because that's how we know that we're really pleasing him. And in this phase, I want to really please God because the people you please today won't be pleased tomorrow. Um, the people who just love you today will be fickle tomorrow. Uh, and I don't mean your loved ones. I just mean fans and the crowd, you know, it, but I want to really understand the bottom line because I want to bring pleasure to God's heart. Because I understand this. I don't know everything about God, but what I know, I do know. I do know this. I know that God is not committed to my dreams or my fantasies. I know that because I've tried to force them on God, and, and God just refuses to participate in that madness. However, however, God is very committed. God will marshal every resource in heaven to the dream that God has given. So I'm trying to get put, use my strength to understand what God's vision is because that's where God will bless you. If you find yourself fighting and battling God, line up with what God wants. Because when you are doing that, God is committed by God's own honor, God's own word, God's own name. God is going to do well by God's vision. And so I want to spend time lining up with God's vision. So Fountain of Life, when I talk to us about these three E's, when I talk to us about what it means to, um, to engage and what I, to engulf and what it means to empower, it's because these principles are true in Scripture. They're what we want to focus on. And God wants us to understand that we need to interact with people and that we need to cover them. I talked about engulfing them next last week, but then also to empower people. Because if you engulf people forever without ever releasing them, empowering them, then they become your pawns. If you engulf people with ever being plant, with ever willing to let them go, then really all you're doing is just using them to make you feel good about yourself. It's why in some of our work through our nonprofit, Nehemiah, we're trying to redo or rethink um, social service programming. And I've been able to do that over the years with great people like you know, Jackie Hunt's here and Tequila and Andre Bernard and others, my mom and others who've worked with us. People who work with us, you know, others who work with us and us providing services, treating people who are on the other side of your clipboard like they are your partners, not like your clients, because your clients always stay on that end of the clipboard. But when you begin to see people who you want to empower, the people that you're serving, they become your colleagues. And that's a whole different way of looking at things. That's, that's empowerment. It's very interesting to me that people who came to this church one day on ankle bracelets are the people who sit next to me and say, now, if you really want to go to the next level, this is what you need to do. I remember when they used to clink when they walked in here. <laughs> and now they're bringing programs to me. Now they've got licensure. Now they say, you know, we got the, we got the numbers and stuff, so we want to. We can open up our own church base, our own community-based um, therapeutic center because we can build people's insurance. But that's empowerment. But if you make that person think that all they are is on the other side of your clipboard, they will never begin to dream with you. 
When you empower people, the very people who you used to serve will help you go where you need to go. It's true. So that's really about empowerment, so that you raised up to go someplace else. I mean, you know, my running joke, what I said to my mom is, I'm part of your retirement plan and your social security plan because you raised me up. You moved me out of where I was on the west side of Chicago. Nothing against Chicago, but I just say, but you raised me up. You brought me here. You made me go to school. You told me to hold my head up. You told me to look people in the eye. So when I stand in front, on stage in front of hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, I didn't just do that because I took a speaking course because it was ingrained in me who I was and what I was supposed to do. And then when you become empowered, you bring that back to the same people who built you up. And so we need to learn how to empower people because it helps you get to where you're going. Don't be afraid of people that you're empowering. Don't be threatened by them. You want to be able to, to do this so that you can, you, can, um, you can send them on out. So today I'm talking about what it looks like to empower others. How do we train others? How do we develop others? How is this a part of our vision? And then I want to get into the story of this new table that Minister Patrick read about. Um, but I want us to learn how to do this. And so um, I want to talk about how, by, I, with these three E's, I talked about how, well, you know, I, I won't say that again. But it's really about being contracted by God, having this legal relationship with people, um, having contact with people. So often we've missed this, but then we want to have impact with people. We want to be able to do this. And so, you know, I call this whole thing, talk about this whole thing about acting, how what we really want to do is we want to contract, we want to contact, and then we want to impact. If we stop by just contracting and realizing I've got this relationship, but we don't act on it, we become, we become useless. So many of us, so many, you know, and this doesn't happen everywhere, but when, as the world gets worse, I listen to people and they say, I just need Jesus to hurry up and come back. But you know, if you get sick, and you dial 911, you do not want the dispatch to say, let's just touch and agree that Jesus is going to come back. <laughs> Otherwise, they will have you on the night news cussing out the operator, saying, you need to, I said, send a truck, a car, a fire, something, a stretcher over here on Charleston Drive. Get over here. You don't want them talking about. So why should the church, when people are dialing 911 in our community, why should we be saying, oh, Jesus, hurry up. We need to roll up our sleeves and find out what we can do because we've been contracted for that. We need to have contact, not be so distant, not be so far removed that we can't relate to people. It's about relating to them. It's about covering them and connecting with them, but impacting. How do you influence people in a way that you can release them so that, they, so that God's plan can be carried out inside of them? Really what empowerment is about is about making people's dreams come true and not their dreams that they have dreamed that we have so um, pimped out dreams. Dreams is not what you go home and make up and push it on God or the church. Dream, when I'm talking about dreaming, I'm talking about vision. I'm talking about the thing for which God has created you. The thing that God wants to create in the world so he brings you into the world to fulfill that, to embody that, so that you carry that out. Think about it for a moment. Your existence is proof that there's something God wants to carry out in the world. Your existence is proof that there's someone God wants to touch, heal, love, forgive, raise up, encourage, that he wants to strengthen. So he creates you to be a part of that plan. And so that's why so many of us, when we're not on that plan, get sucked into spending, consumerism, drugs, broken relationship again and again and again. Because we are made for something that's so divine that unless God pulls us into it, everything else will entice us to try to get into that thing. Because inside ourselves, we know we're meant to do something great. And when that's not centered in God, it will appeal to our senses. But we are created to do something great and something wonderful. But that's because it's God's dream and God's plan for us. So as God's empowerment comes upon us, we find ways to empower others. Here's how you find out if you really have been empowered by God. Here's how you find out if God's really working inside you. Do you empower others? Don't raise your hands. And I certainly don't want my employees to raise their hands. But have you ever worked for an insecure person? <laughs> You've got to be empowered to empower others. And sometimes your team just, ha just has to help you because when you understand your position, you help others. Now, I told you all, I am administratively challenged on many fronts. And so sometimes my real organized people, God just gives, gives me an excessive grace with them. They try not to shoot me, at least not with bullets, just with their words and their thoughts. Right, Karen? And so... Um, so every once in a while, my team has to take me to the side and say, when you don't fully get in your place of leadership, when you're micromanaging, we don't release things, 
then it hinders us from really doing what we're supposed to do. So as you get more in your position, you help us to get in our position. So a true sign that we are empowering others, that we've been empowered by God, that we're in the right place, is that we are able to empower others. That should be a goal for us. We should not hinder others or slow others down. We should be in a place so that we can really empower others. And for those of us who read scripture about God's word and God's promises and his blessings, and they want to have that power to experience it, you've got to remember that those who were sent and spent by God were those who went for God. The anointing is not going to catch you by just sitting up, when you're sitting up at home thinking about God. The true power of God is not going to come on you by just thinking good thoughts. As you go, the spirit of God is going to catch you. As you move, as you go forward, God's presence will capture you. It will move on you. So you've got to be able to move. So I want to talk today about dreams that are made. But I want to, I want to, to refer to this as the new table. I want to talk about this for a few minutes and use this as a way of inviting us to the Lord's table and just asking the Lord to adjust in our hearts just a little bit. What I love about scripture is that it can mean so many different things depending on where you are, what you're reading, and what you're thinking, how you're processing. And so depending on where I am and how the Spirit is dealing with me, the story of Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel 9 speaks all kinds of things to me. It's about family. It's about leadership. It's about leadership development. Um, it's about restoration. It's about hope. It's about identity. It's about humility. It's about a whole lot of things. But today I want to talk about this in terms of it being a new table and an opportunity for a new table. And as I, as I, as I teach this, don't think of yourself as the one being called to the table as much as the one who can call people to the table. All right? I used to say that at the end, but I want to say that up front so that you don't miss what we're saying. David was a shepherd, and he was used by God. You can't tell God who to use and who to love. You cannot tell God who's unworthy. You, that person can't be used by you, God. They're not worthy. God will find who God wants to use, and I love that. Do not rule yourself out, and do not rule out those that you're praying for. God will use the most unlikely people. David was the smallest, the youngest, the, 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 lit, the, the runt of the litter of his family. For whatever reason, God loved him some David. He used David to slay Goliath. We all know that story. I won't go into all the background. But it gave David some notoriety. You can go from just being ordinary and be catapulted into something very significant by just stepping with God, what God wants you to do. But I also think that God prepared David for this. Saul, who was the king, wanted to help David fight. So when David was going to go before Goliath, he gave him his own sword, his own shield, his own armor. David put it on, but he said, no, I haven't tried this. I want to let you know something. When you are facing the greatest battle of your lives, don't run someone else's strategy. Do what God told you to do. Everybody else might be ducking, and God may say, stand tall. Everyone else might be talking, God may say, shh. Everybody else might be, shh, and God may say, speak up. But I have to tell you, when you are, at, when you are in war, you must use the strategy that God has given you because only God's strategy for you will work. You can try to use someone else's, but I guarantee you, people have lost races when they've been better runners. They've lost games when they've been better players by coming off their game. Stay with what God told you to do. Do what God told you to do. David tried what God told him to do. He put the armor on, but he told Saul, he said, King, I'm sorry, I can't use this stuff. This is not what, this is not what I know. I know some slings. I know these things. I'm going to fight. David fought the way that he did using what God wanted him to do. When David fought Goliath, he became very famous. Saul became very jealous and threatened and tried to kill him. Saul's son, Jonathan, who was next in line to be king, hid with David and told David what his father was doing. Not only was Saul going to kill David because he thought David was trying to take his kingdom, he was going to kill his son, Saul, his son, Jonathan, for trying to help David out. Now, that's wrong when you haven't done anything wrong but just try to help somebody. And you get into trouble. I'll jump over this story because it's, it's enough for a sermon in and of itself. But David and Jonathan became close friends. They were also brothers-in-law because David um, was married to a sister. Eventually was married to a sister. That was sort of a reward for fighting Goliath. 
So David married into the royal family. And he and Jonathan became friends, and they swore to each other. Here's how Mephibosheth begins to come into the story. When Saul and Jonathan died on the same day, the king and the crown prince died on the same day. People assumed David killed them or had them killed. Nothing can be further from the truth because David loved Saul and Jonathan. But Phibosheth was a little baby. He was Jonathan's son. He was a royal grandson, the son of the gentleman who's probably going to be king. His nurse was running with him because they heard that the, that the king had died. She was running with the baby. She tripped and she fell on him. When she fell, his feet were broken, and he was lame from, since he was about five years old. So they were running from David. She falls on him. He's lame. David comes into position. David gets blessed. And listen, empowered people, prestige, I mean, prestigious people, um, privileged people, educated people, people with extra food, extra wealth, um, extra ideas, extra thought, extra, extra clothing. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen real closely here. Because even without preaching about generosity, I want to bring this into this subject. When David became king over the northern and the southern kingdom, when he became the king over this, when he was thankful for his blessing, here's how you know you've been blessed. He sat down and started thinking, who can I bless? When your blessings don't allow you to ask about someone else, you're not blessed yet. You got stuff, but you're not blessed. You got money, but you're not blessed. You got extra money at the end of the month, but you're not blessed yet. You got clothes that you say you're going to get back into, but you're really not blessed yet. The way you really show God that you've been truly blessed is when you are fed, when you are warm, when you're sitting in front of your fireplace, when you're watching your television, when you're feeling satisfied with your meal, when you're looking at your wonderful family and your children, your spouse, your kids, when you get what you've got, then you begin to think, who doesn't have this? At that point, your wealth, your knowledge, your information has just become a tool of heaven. Until that happens, it will war against your own soul. That's why this message and what I'm saying about when I talk about generosity is not about having stuff because God gives us stuff, allows us to get stuff. So I'm not preaching that, so don't hear that at all. But when our stuff smothers us so that we can't see God or anybody else, that stuff becomes an idol. But every once in a while, you got to push back from the stuff and ask, who hasn't eaten today? Who doesn't have three pairs of shoes? Who doesn't have a necktie? Who hasn't had some meat this week? Who needs, who needs to write? Who needs a phone call? Who needs encouragement? Who needs these things? And David was so blessed. He started thinking about who he could bless. You see, people who make their way to the table have got to create room for people to come to the table. Because God has not put you at the table to stretch yourself out and put your own elbows down and say, listen, I got here, you better get yours. I got mine, you better get yours. God might have thrown you up on the table so you can get there rearranged and tell somebody, come over here, get a chair and come right here. We forget that because we act like when we get to the table, it's going to take something away from us. That when we get to the table, it's going to make us look like we're, less, that we're not as significant when the only reason God has many of us at the table is to invite somebody else to the table. Because the truth of the matter is, somebody made room for you. Oh, I know you think because you're good looking. I know you think because you're smart and you're sharp. I know because you can write, you can sing, you can organize, you can administrate. You think that your hard work has gotten you there. But you don't even understand that while you were sleeping, God started moving and orchestrating. He started touching people that don't even know you. He started putting you on people's hearts. He started moving stuff around and opening up jobs so that when you come in, he moves you right to the table. So that when you get to the table, you forget who brought you to the table. You forget who you're supposed to bring to the table. And God really put you at the table to bring somebody else to the table. And the person you're ignoring can be the world changer that's going to help your children come to the table. You see, when Jesus was ministering in the Decapolis, the 10 cities, the folks didn't like him because he healed the man that was filled with demons and cutting himself. They told Jesus to leave, but he put the little man with the cutting issues right into position. He brought him to the table. The man tried to leave and said, I want to come with you. Jesus said, no. He propped him up and said, you stay right here. He starts preaching about Jesus. Three chapters later, they invite Jesus to come back. You see, when you think that the, see, because we don't know seasons, and because insecurity takes us over, we ride the table like it's the end of the line. But every table I'm at is just preparation for a real table I'm going to. And how I act at this table determines how I sit at that table. 
And if I get sloppy and greedy and selfish at this table, then I don't have a right to sit at that table. So this table is a practice table for the permanent table that's coming. So you need to act like you're at the table. Get your elbows off of it. <laughs> sit up at it. Look around and ask who else is supposed to be here. I know you think you might not shine. You might be the only one, the first one, the last one. But you need to get there and ask, God, who else do you want up at this table? Who do you want to bring? Who you're speaking to? Who you're trying to raise up? I'm doing things because of doors people have opened that have given me opportunities for change, transformation, and hope. And I become a minister to the children of the people who open doors for me. The very doors they opened have given me the skills to know, to know how to go back to that same family that was gracious enough to open the door for me and teach them things that God has said to me to tell them that has changed their lives. The very person you're trying to block is the one that can reach your child that you can't. The very person that you're trying to block has the skill set to lead you forward. But when you learn to bring people to the table and to bless them, to encourage them, it opens doors. You got to be able to do that. When you start blocking stuff, you miss what God is trying to give you. Is this making sense? So when David was sitting back, thinking about his family, thinking about his blessing, thinking about how glad he was, he said, hey, Ziba, because Ziba used to work for Saul. Ziba, is there anybody in Saul's family that's still alive? Because I'm sitting there thinking about my blessings, and I want to be a blessing to his family because I made a vow to Jonathan. You ever made a vow to somebody? You ever told somebody, I love your kids, I watch out for your family? You ever tell somebody that? David told Jonathan that. Ziba said, yeah, well, he's got a son living down in uh, Later Bar. His name is um, Mephibosheth. Uh, but before David could get excited, so I think about how he can position himself, oh, but he's crippled in the feet. You ever have anybody try to discredit you before you get to the table? Oh, you know, she didn't finish her degree yet. Oh, you know that she hasn't finished a graduate program. You know, he doesn't get along with others real well. So they see that somehow the, the, the radar has gotten on you. So you're about to come up. So they see you, 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 you're the one that's been spotlighted. So before you can even get there, you just mind your own business. They just say, her. And so Alicia looks up. Yes, come here. Before she can even get there, well, you know what? She's from Louisiana. She country. <laughs> Told promoter, she's not going to be here long. She don't like the cold. She can't handle the cold. Told promoter. So then they start discrediting him. He's crippled. He can't walk. He can't do nothing. Nobody's going to follow a prince with no feet. David said, go get him. Go down to the bar and get him. And he comes to the table. Let's talk about Mephibosheth for just a minute. He probably didn't have a true sense of worth or identity. His father died. His grandfather died. Nobody's trying to help him ascend to the throne because by rights, if it weren't for David, he would be on the throne. He would be on the throne. So when David calls for him, he knows what this means. This man's about to put a knife in my throat. So he probably also was told, he killed your father. He killed your grandfather. He doesn't really know who you are. So he probably struggled besides having his own physical limitations. His father died. His grandfather died. And his uncle, who's now on the throne, probably hates him. He's probably hiding and not really living. He's got all this great stuff going on inside him. So he probably has royal blood in his veins, but he has no avenue for living it out. There's a lot of people around you that got potential and royal blood in their veins, but nobody's called it out yet. But he was called into community to show God's compassion, not David's, but God's compassion. And he now was at the table because David said, come and let him sit at the table. But listen to this. This is what I love about David. And listen, empowerment people, you got to get this point. This is what's hard for us in leadership. I'm going to be really honest for just a minute. We as pastors do not do a good job of this. We do not do a good job of this. I talk to a lot of my colleagues who are sort of um, planted by churches. As soon as their congregations get larger than their spiritual fathers, the spiritual fathers disown them. 
As long as you need me, as long as I can teach you, as long as I can say, yeah, I helped them going, yeah, I helped them going, I helped this person get going, yeah, I knew Anthony way back when, yeah, I knew Paul way back when. But then when you start really blowing up, well, you know, Paul didn't really do all them designs. I really did some of them. I think it was really clip art. I really saw him tracing. You know, Anthony is really lip syncing. He's not really dropping all that stuff. He was really here all night practicing on that stuff. Don't nobody really freestyle like that. <laughs> Folks start getting threatened. When you begin to understand that it is God's plan and he begins to bring people beyond you, you understand that God has just used you to help and strengthen others. So let me tell you what David did. When he came and he invited Mephibosheth to the table, now in this part of the world, this part of culture, sitting at someone's table is being family. Remember, that's why they would say to Jesus, why are you sitting with tax collectors? Why are you sitting with drug dealers? Because when you sat with someone, you made yourself like them. So you didn't just sit at someone because it was a lunch counter. You know, you didn't just go sit down and say, excuse me, this seat taken, can I sit here? No, you didn't do that. Because if you were sitting by thieves, you were a thief. If you were sitting by robbers, you were a robber. If you were sitting by people that were adulterers, you were adulterers. So to invite, to invite Mephibosheth to sit at the table meant somebody had to scoot over, and he had to sit down. But David took it a step further, because sometimes we just invite people to the table, but we don't really give them power to be at the table. David says, Zeba, I want you to go and take all the land that belonged to Saul, and I want you to give it to Mephibosheth. But I told you, he can't walk. I know, but you can so I want you to go plant his seed. I want you to grow his seed. I want you to weed his fields. I want you to water them. And if it's not enough water, I want you to irrigate it. When it is harvest time, I want you to plant. I want you to pluck it. I want you to wash it. I want you to take it down to the market and sell it for him. And even if he doesn't sell, I want you to boil it, put some sugar in it. I want you to can it so he can have some preserves when you want to eat some jelly on his cornbread. Work the fields for him so that while Mephibosheth is sitting there under the table, money is coming into him because David is not giving him allowance. He has his own field. True empowerment means that people are independent of your control. Will you give people the empowerment to manage, to lead, to serve? in a way that you can't control it. That's true empowerment. We have not been called by scripture to merely manage. Nothing's wrong with management, except it's not necessarily what empowerment is about. Empowerment is, will you give them the ability to sit at the table and say, I've got something to say. You see what happened with the deacons in Acts 6, 7? Is that when they brought Stephen to the table because the Greek widows weren't being fed right, and they brought Stephen to the table, he told a whole other story about history. Because while they're talking about Palestine, 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 God loves the Holy Land. God loves the Holy Land. God loves this area. Stephen says, well, God was working out in Mesopotamia. Way before God started working over here, they said, what? Start picking up stones. Because outsiders who come to the table have different stories. They see the nursery rhymes a little bit different. They put hot sauce on stuff you don't put hot sauce on. <laughs> they put sauce on stuff you put hot sauce on. They eat with different utensils. They do it differently. So when you invite people to the table, it's going to be a different meal because they're going to eat it differently, explain it differently, and process it differently. So if you want people just to come to your table and eat like you, you're not going to empower anybody. David brought Mephibosheth to the table. He was resourced independently of David, and he was resourced appropriately. He gave him what he needed. He ate with the king's sons, heard their strategies, their conquests, their dreams. He got to hear how empowered people think. You know, sometimes being at the table is not running things. Sometimes it's shutting your mouth and learning some things. Do you know how much stuff I learned by just being at certain tables? I realized I did not have to be the class clown. I did not have to be the resident theologian. I can just sit there and take notes and say, hmm. But just being at certain tables, you find out where money is. You find out where employees are. There are things I have found out by just sitting there. Because when you quiet, when you talk, people realize you're foolish. When you be quiet, people talk because they don't necessarily see you. So people start throwing out information like, hmm. I didn't know that that person was philanthropic. Hmm. I didn't know they cared about this issue. 
hmm, I didn't know that this was going on. By just being at the table listening, how strategic and royal people think, strategize, talk about the conquest and their dream, it can begin to change the way you're thinking. So before they even brought Mephibosheth a piece of bread, by listening to the king's sons come in each day and just check in on what their day is like could change you and stretch you. You ever been a part of a conversation where you weren't talking, just listening, and you learned a whole lot? Now, not a whole lot of you said anything. You know what that probably means? It probably means either someone has not properly brought you to the table or you got to the table running your mouth. I heard some people talking recently, and they said, you know what? That person is a good proxy for their director, but when they come to these meetings, they need to shut up and listen. They'll learn a lot more. He brought him to the table. He got a chance to listen. And here's the last point. None of this would be appropriate or what happened if Mephibosheth didn't first change his address. Because David moved him. A lot of us won't come to the table and be, impaired, be impaired, empowered because you don't want to move. You want to eat from the table from where you're sitting. Spoons aren't that long and the table's not that wide. When David sent for him, he came. So when opportunities for empowerment come, are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you consistent? Will you step up? Will you shut up? Will you listen up? And will you make the necessarily changes to be there? We've got to release people to do God's work and to serve God. Now, let me tell you something. Empowerment is dangerous because it takes away all your excuses because God has already assessed what you can handle and what you can't. And so when God gives you empowerment to do a thing, you can't say, well, my legs, I got somebody to work it for you. My back, I got somebody, I got you. My eye, I got you. It's hot, I got you, fan. It's cold, layer. Don't ask for God's power and then make excuses. Because like Mephibosheth, all he had to do was sit at the table. Somebody was already working it for him, already growing it for him, already selling it for him, already canning it for him, already bringing him the money. All he had to do was keep showing up at the table every day. Because there was space made for him. What does this have to do with anything? The Lord is challenging us as pastors. He's saying, the people need to be more committed to me than they are to you. They need to respond to the cause, to the call, to scripture. And the people need to be released. I'm going to turn the tables on you all. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it because perhaps you're different, perhaps I'm different. Historically, initially, the church was really about people who are hiding for their lives. And they were coming to get hope to stand in a community where the church was hated. Somewhere the church morphed into something that's a little different. And it became about positions and ministries and programs. And some of that has been helpful. A lot of it hasn't been. So people come to church and we say, I need you in the choir. I need you to praise dance. I need you to set up communion. I need you to direct the choir. I need you to help with the young people. I need you to preach and build and do this kind of stuff. And nothing's wrong with that because we need those things to be finished. But church has not become a place where someone says, I've got a vision. I've got a desire to do something. Here's what we do in church. We don't have that in our plan. Um, why don't you pray again? And in the meanwhile, why don't you direct the children's choir? It has not become a place where dreams are made. It has not become a place where someone can say, I want to become a warming center when it's really cold. I want to feed people when they're really hungry. I want to really help kids who can't read. Can we use some of our children's space for respite for moms who are really on the edge and need a place just to come and bring their children so they can go shop or to the library and read or just go take a nap someplace? Can we, can we do that? That's not really in our plan, but I, I tell you what, if you teach Sunday school for the little children across the street, so here's what I'm saying. Let's turn this thing on its head, church. 
Let's not let this be about the program of the church. What if you're not here just to help a dream come to pass? What if the vision God has put inside you is part of this whole big vision for touching our community? What if you have been created to do something that's very great that may not be in my plan, but you need to bug me to make it a part of the plan? What if there is something you've been created to be that's going to help final life become the thing it's supposed to be so that the kingdom of God is relevant like it's supposed to be, but we have not created an environment for you to be creative. You have not trusted us with your dreams, so we just sit there looking at each other. So we stand, we sit, we kneel, we dip, we go back to our seat, we write checks, we fill our cars, we go home, and then we do it all over again. I think we can do better than that. I think we ought to be a place. We used to teach kids how to give speeches. We used to teach people how to lead and organize. But the church would teach people how to lead. I was convicted by something this week. Dr. Gloria Lassen, I shouldn't even say who said this. Dr. Gloria Lassen Billing, good friend of mine. She just said, Pastor, I was listening to Michael Eric Dyson give a talk, and he said, he challenged the pastors and said, maybe if you lifted the young people's dreams, they lift their pants. Maybe if the church was a place where their dreams were lifted, and when I'm talking about their pants, I'm not just talking about sagging, I'm talking cold over the kids' heads. I laughed at that because that sounds so Dyson-like. But then I thought, do we make dreams come to pass? Or do we just cookie cut you into what we want to do? Have we killed the creativity with which you were created? Do you build industry and creative in your jobs every day and you come into church and we make you dumb down? Do we do that to you? Do you create new ideas and new systems and webs and pictures and photos, and then you come here and we make you color with Crayolas? Do you change the world outside there and make you afraid to change your seat in here? If so, I'm sorry. Because we have been called to empower, which means it's not just pushing what's in me on you. Because God's going to get what he's put in me done. He's been doing it for 30 years. With six people, with 12, with 20, with 30, with 40, with 50, with 100, with 200, he gets it done. But what I believe God's going to ask me is not how I built, but who I built. It's not what I did, but who I did it with. It's not how I grew, but who I grew with me. So, Father of Life, let's turn this thing on its head. Let's look at real empowerment. Let's make room for people to come and sit at the table. You've got ideas that push things ahead that I only dream about. Or I don't even have the energy to make it happen. What if worship became something that gave you room to dream? What if it became a place where you could say, now listen, if you're going to come with me with an idea, you better come with me with six people that going to help you do it. Because empowerment is not me telling you to be free and you come tell me what I need to do. I got a wife, a mama, a daughter, a board. I got a lot of people telling me what to do. <laughs> However, when you come and say, we got an idea, we got a thought, we got a plan. We got six people. This is what we want to do. We'll handle it. We'll, get, we, we'll, we'll do this. When the county executive called about the warming center, Pastor Kevin called Kim. Another one said, we got it. Because we're already planning and thinking and talking about it. The program that Sister Roxanne's doing downstairs, we got it. They've already been talking about it. She got her team involved in it. Let's turn this thing on its head. Let's not just come here and beat tambourines and wear robes and sit on comfortable seats and then go home not feeling stretched. I want you to dream, people. I want you to breathe. I want you to be who God called you to be. you got royal blood running through your veins, and we have not properly called it out. And listen, I don't mean just ideas here. It could be ideas outside. The, what you have inside your heart might not be something that's a church program, but I might know someone. It might be someone who's in a position, an office, a, 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 a company who can help that happen. But I just want to say to you as your pastor, this needs to be a place where dreams come alive. The world has been changed by a church, and we have neutered it. We have neutralized it. We have pacified it. We've taken all this power away. I was interviewed for an article for the Christian Post. They said, well, I know you're trying to do all this stuff about community and reconciliation. It's a paper out in D.C. 
they caught stuff about the town hall meeting. And they said, I know you're doing all this stuff, but what should, I mean, like, what if Jesus comes back before you get a chance to roll out your plan? I said, I didn't realize I said this until Gloria read this to me. I said, did you, did you really make this quote? I said, Jesus ain't coming to take this mess back to heaven yet. <laughs> and I forgot I said, be careful when you're talking to the media, all right? Be careful, because folks have tape recorders and iPhones and stuff. Be careful what you say. So write out and then print, you know, Jesus ain't coming to get this mess. <laughs> but you know what? He's not. Listen, earth can barely stomach us. Heaven's not ready for this. We're getting there. But the community's tired of us. God is, you know. All right, let me come on back. Karen, let's hit the fourth slide as I, as I wrap this up. When empowering, God has already assessed where you're limited by reality, which he can change. Maybe the resources aren't there. Maybe the people aren't there. God can change that. But when God wants to empower you, he also knows that your limited perceptions of him can keep you from really being empowered, which you must be willing to have change through community and prayer and in the word. Third thing is that you are limited in your, in your empowerment by your limited understanding of yourself in Christ. And this is really the hardest one to change because this happens in community. This happens when people around you. I used to be an average writer. I was afraid of English. But when I got older, people said, you know what? You can write. You're pretty good with a pen. I was not a public speaker, but people called it out of me. When I was a teenager, people said, I think God's hand is on you to preach. There's nothing that I'm doing that I ever sat down by myself and said I'm going to do. People called it out of me. I was almost out of this community because I was tired. And friends outside the community said, you're not finished in Madison yet. What are you doing out here? That's not what God's saying to you. When we tried to sell this property, people in this church said, you said when you were 16, God gave you a dream and gave you a word that he was going to put this church on a hill and the whole city would see it. That plot of land on Rimrock Road is not on a hill. <laughs> Folks in this church said that to me. There's so many things that I do because community has called it out. We are empowered in community. I need community to remind me of who I am. Community keeps reminding me of what I can do and who I am. Those of you that are just running by yourself, you're just running as a loner, I guarantee you, you're not at your best. I guarantee you're not at your best. Ask any runner, your best race is when you got competition. You got somebody right next to you. I'm telling you, if you're running this thing by yourself because you just don't trust people because people have hurt you, you are not fully empowered because the community, a group, is going to call you out into what you're supposed to be. So now as you're blessed, who do you need to think about? Who do you need to reflect on? And who do you need to invite to the table? I've just got, I think, three steps for you this week. And if you follow us on Facebook or part of our Fountain of Life group on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, all these notes that you've seen up here and more are already uploaded. By the end of the day, um, Karen and her team make sure that the audio link is up and my sermon notes are up. So if you want to process it, here are the next steps. Get to a new table. Push back from the one that's not getting you where you're going. Push away. If you don't like what they're being served, if it's making you sick to your stomach, if you're not growing, push back. And can I be honest? The table that many of you are at is a table you set for yourself. I know people say, I set goals higher for me than anybody else. No, that's not biblical. I know you set high goals, but some of those are out of pride and out of fear, and you're trying to prove something to a mama or daddy that you never got approval from. Keep that junk out the church. Nobody's going to call you anything greater than the community of God. The community of God calls that stuff about you. I'm telling you it does. I'm not saying you can't get good ideas by yourself, but you can kill yourself with your ideas. Community can tell you can't do all of that. Pick two. That's going to kill you. You got a wife. You got a daughter. You got health. You got a church. You can't do all of that. Pick two. Second piece. Second thing. Get around people who awaken God's dream for you. Get around people who not just help you dream, but awaken God's dream inside you. It's God's dream. It's not your dream. Final people. I know people like that who they awaken. Now, I got people that help me manage it. I got people who help me carry it. But I've got some friends. And listen, let me tell you how they are. Let me give you some help. Let me tell you who they are, all right? I know you're thinking about somebody. Are they afraid of you? That's not the person. 
You know who I want you to put on the list? The first one you thought about and said, not them, because they're mean. That's what I want you to put on the list. <laughs> the person you thought about, because they're not nice. I remember one time I was talking with Pastor Sam. Pastor Sam Duran preached last month. Uh, and I love Pastor Sam, but I hate him too. But um, <laughs> Pastor Sam's one of my closest friends. I spent, all, I spent yesterday evening, um, I can just call him up someday and just say, I haven't had any Malaysian rice for a while. Can I just come over there? Because that man can cook. He is a chef from, well, my, yeah, he's dangerous. But one of the times we really connected, we were sitting at Perkins over here, and he said, Pastor G. Did I sound like him? <laughs> Pastor G, I've been watching you over the years. So before I met him, he would park in our driveway. He didn't know who we were. He would come in the middle of the night and pray for this church. He said the spirit told him to come over here and pray for like three years. But years before we met, he came and prayed for me. He had no idea he'd be preaching here. Would pray. He said, Pastor G, I've been watching you. You're a talented man. You have certainly got the goods, but you don't have the guts. I said, what the? Don't you know you don't talk to black preachers like that? I don't know how y'all roll in India. But in Africa, America? I was like, check. <laughs> Piss me off. Don't tell me I got God. I, I like Sam up to that point. I loved him after that meal. Because you need people who will go off on you without even knowing, without even saying, brace yourself. You know, you got some friends that would say, sit down. Hold on to something. No, he would reach across the table and dip in my barbecue sauce with his chicken tender. And tell me I ain't got guts. And anybody who knows me knows that I don't play dipping in my food. So you know I was upset that I didn't even, I was so shocked. They're just like, here, just dip it again. <laughs> I was out in California running away from home. Church home. My buddy John Teeter said, listen, I know you probably think it's pretty cool <laughs> traveling all over the world with these Korean millionaires. As he said to me, just like that, he's Korean too. I know you think it's pretty cool running all around the world in these airplanes with these Wall Street Korean businessmen. But you know what? Nothing is as honorable as serving the local church in the city where God has called you. When are you going to finish what you started in Madison? Listen, I was staying with him. You see, Jay, when you're when you in a hotel, that's why I, I'm going to stay in hotels. Because when, when you got a hotel, you can go call, you know, Google and get the cab and get to the hotel. Like, I don't have to be talked to like this. When you're in people's house and you got to go and have dinner with them. I came back home. You need people who empower you. By not telling you you're great, you're smart, you're sharp, you're cute. You need people to challenge you by saying, you wrong. That's ignorant. That's pretty funny. <laughs> That's not going to work. Hmm. So what you said the spirit told you before, was that spirit line or this one? You need people like that in your life. Get people around you who awaken God's dream. And the third thing, try a life group. After church today, we're going to be signing people right out here. My friend Jenny Schultz has been helping us coordinate this. We've got, I don't know how many people, 10, 11 people that have agreed to be small group coordinators. We've been trying, Nick and Stephanie was trying this way back when y'all were here. We finally pray for it that we get it this time. Um, but we want to get into life with each other. I know that's strange, like seven weeks, meeting together. What are we going to do? What are we going to talk about? Show up. 
You meet people every week that ain't doing nothing for you. Meet some people that are going to do something for you. And if you got to the point where you got all the truth and all the push and all the challenge that you need, then stay home. Watch Scandal. <laughs> but I need to be around people who challenge me. John messed me up so bad, I'm scared to get on an airplane. And if I do, it's not going to be with Koreans. Because he just called me out so bad. I'm teasing. I'm just, I'm just, what I'm saying is, I've been hard pressed even. I don't even think I've been out of the country after that. He just rebuked me so hard. When I try to plan something, my little Delta app just shut down and said, You wrong. <laughs> Come on, people. It's time to grow. It's time to be at our best for God. It's time to be sharp for God. Because when you are on point, the Spirit of the Lord hits you. And when the Spirit of the Lord hits you, you are effective for the kingdom. Let's stop being half-hearted Christian. Let's be people that are on fire for God and who love the Lord. Let's do that and be alive for him. Can we do that? Yes. Come on, let's give him some praise. <laughs> now listen, people. Here's why we celebrate the Lord's table because the one we're sitting at doesn't work that well the one we sit at ourselves that's why I had Minister Patrick read the 23rd Psalms he prepares me a table in the presence of my enemies he gives me strength and sustenance and a sense of family and identity he resources me when my enemies are trying to shut me down the last thing you want to do when your enemies are pursuing you is to eat because you have to rest. But for the Lord to prepare you a table when your enemies are after you is God's way of saying, stop, I've got a force field around you. Remember, I'm behind you. So when I'm talking about coming to a new table and I look at Mephibosheth and I invite us to look at the Lord's table, I want you to come with new eyes and new ears. I want you to see a God who wants to empower you not one of you, not one single, not a single one of you. Not a single one is a misfit, an outcast. No one in here is damaged goods. Do you hear me? You are called, you are loved, you are purposed, you are forgiven. His glory rests upon you. And so he invites us to his table to remind us, hey, nobody, I came from heaven and got a body to die for you to show you somebody in heaven loves you, to show you that somebody in heaven feels you, to show you that you've got a dream that's inside of you. And so I want you to stop throwing your life away and your dreams away. I want you to know that there is a healing bomb in Gilead. And so when we come to the table, it's not just to remind us that you are forgiven. It is to remind you that you are loved. You are loved. So when we come today, let's not be in a hurry. We only do this once a month. This is our family meal. We come to a new table. He doesn't tell you sit up, get your elbows off the table, stop slouching. He knows when you're tired, sometimes you got to slouch. Sometimes if it weren't for your elbows on the table, you'd fall off. He just wants you to be at the table. Just be at the table. Just be at the table. Rest. And just tell yourself today, I'm at the table. I'm messed up. I don't feel worthy. If a light came down and you saw everything I fought, everything I felt, everything I did, this thing would blow up. But you know what? The blood came so that nothing would blow up. Hell blew up so you don't have to blow up. So when you come to the Lord's table today, I want you to reposition your thinking. I want you to come up out of loaded bar. I want you to come out of this place, and I want you to move to the Lord's table, not just for today. I want you to declare your permanent residence, your permanent citizenship in the kingdom of God, at the table of God. This thing is no joke. God laid this table and the cup is filled with the blood of his son. And if you think that your sins are so bad that he would forget his own son, 
you don't know who you are and who he is. So today when we come to the Lord's table, let's make a declaration that all hell will know. I'm not a citizen of your sphere anymore. You don't control my mind and my thought, my relationships, my wallet, my heart. I am a citizen of God's kingdom. I'm a part of the kingdom of God. I'm his family. And I'm putting my elbows on the table and my bare feet under the table. And I'm at the Lord's table and I can belch and I can scratch and I can sit and I can reach and I can ask for seconds. Because my daddy is calling us home. It's time to change our thinking. We are empowered people. We are not devoured people. We are not soured people. We are built up, flowered, and showered people. We are people that are lifted and loved by God, and today we need to act like it. So leave your sins on your seat. Leave your feelings on your sleeves. Bring your souls and your heart to this table. Come get some of this bread and dip it up in this cup here and say, I'm coming to a new table. In my mind, I have been created to change the world, not contaminate it. As long as the devil can tell you you're the problem, you will never be the solution. We come to the Lord's table. Let's send the enemy straight to his house. And let's remember, let's remember the king has invited us.